Hello, well, oh, hello. Um, first off, a slight apology for the um, dearth of videos at the moment, but uh, things have been somewhat busy, and much to my disgruntlement, um, the previous video that I've done here, um, times two, there's been horrific problems with the audio. I'm not sure what it was. Occasionally, there'd be horrible bursts of static through it, and I'm honestly not sure what the problem was. So uh, we've actually moved over to using a new microphone. So um, be very interested to see what your guys' opinions of the uh, new uh, system is, and uh, we'll see how we do. Now, are you going to sit down, or are you going to stand there all day? Because uh, I can't actually read the book with you there. Come on, sit down. So chapter four of the Lost World is actually uh, where the story really begins to get going and we understand a little bit about where the adventure is likely to take us. Come on, Chief, what are you doing? You're being a pain in the neck now. Either sit down or go away. I don't mind which. Okay, sit down. Good boy. Down. Come on, down. You're going or coming? And lo, the dance of the cat continues. What on earth are you doing? And he's gone. Okay. With that out of the way, let's begin with chapter four. Hardly was it shut when Mrs. Challenger darted out from the dining room. The small woman was in a furious temper. She barred her husband's way like an enraged chicken in front of a bulldog. It was evident that she'd seen my exit, but had not observed my return. You brute, George, she screamed. You've hurt that nice young man. He jerked his thumb backwards. He's safe and sound behind me. She was confused, but not unduly so. I I'm so sorry I didn't see you. I assure you, madam, that everything is all right. She was confused, but not unduly so. I'm so sorry I didn't see you. I can assure you, madam, it's all quite all right. But he's marked your poor face. Oh, George, what a brute you are. Nothing but scandals from one end of the week to the other. Everyone hating and making fun of you. You've finished my patience. This ends it. Dirty linen, he rumbled. It's not a secret, she cried. Do you suppose that the whole of the street, the whole of London for that matter? Oh, get away, Austin. We don't want you here. Don't you suppose that they don't all talk about you? Where is your dignity? You're a man who should have been Regis Professor at a great university with a thousand students all revering you. Where is your dignity, George? How about yours, my dear? Oh, you try me too much. A ruffian. A common, brawling ruffian. That's what you've become. Be good, Jessie. A roaring, ranging bully. That's done it. Stool of penance, he said. To my amazement, he stooped, picked her up, and placed her sitting on a high pedestal of black marble in the angle of the hall. It was at least seven feet high, and so thin that she could hardly balance upon it. A more absurd object than she presented, cocked up there with her face convulsed with anger, and her feet dangling, and her body rigid for fear of upset, I could not imagine. Let me down, she demanded. Say please. You brute, George, let me down this in it. Come into the study, Mr. Malone. Uh, really, sir? I said, looking at the lady. Here's Mr. Malone, pleading for you, Jessie. Say, please, and you can come down. Oh, you brute. Please, please. He took her down as if she'd been a canary. Now, you must behave yourself, dear. Mr. Malone is a pressman. He will have it in his rago tomorrow and sell a dozen extra copies amongst our neighbours. Strange story of high life. You felt fairly high on that pedestal, didn't you? Then a subtitle, a glimpse of a singular menage. He's a foul feeder, is Mr Malone, a carry-on eater, like all of his kind. 
A swine from the devil's herd. That's it. Malone, what? You really are intolerable, I said hotly. He bellowed with laughter. <laughs> we shall have a coalition presently, he boomed, looking from his wife to me and puffing out his enormous chest. Then suddenly altering his tone. Excuse these frivolous family bandages, Mr. Malone. I called you back for a serious purpose, rather than mix you up in some domestic little pleasantry. Run away, little woman, and don't fret. He placed a huge hand on each of her shoulders. All that you say is perfectly true. I should be a better man if I did what you advise. But I shouldn't be quite George Edward Challenger. There are plenty of better men, my dear, but only one G.E.C. So make the best of him. He suddenly gave her a resounding kiss, which embarrassed me even more than his violence had done. Now, Mr. Malone, he continued, with a great accession of dignity, this way, if you please. We entered the room, which we'd left so tumultuously ten minutes before. The professor closed the door carefully behind us and motioned me into an armchair and pushed a cigar box under my nose. A real San Juan, Colorado, he said. Excitable people like you are better for narcotics. Heavens, don't bite it. Cut, and cut with reverence. <sighs> now, lean back and listen attentively to whatever I may care say to you. If a remark should occur to you, you can reserve it for some more opportune time. First of all, as your return to my house after your most justifiable expulsion, he protruded his beard and stared at me as one who challenges and invites contradiction. After, as I say, your well-merited expulsion, the reason lay in your answer to that most officious policeman, in which I seemed to discern some glimmering of good feeling upon your part. More, at any rate, I am accustomed to associate with your profession. In admitting that the fault of the incident lay with you, you gave some evidence of a certain mental detachment and a breadth of view which attracted my favourable notice. The subspecies of the human race to which you unfortunately belonged has always been below my mental horizon. Your words brought you suddenly above it. You swam up into my serious notice. For this reason, I asked you to return with me, as I was minded to make you a further acquaintance. You will kindly deposit your ash in the small Japanese tray on the bamboo table, which stands to your left elbow. All this he boomed forth like a professor addressing his class. He'd swung around his revolving chair as to face me, and he sat all puffed up like an enormous bullfrog. He laid his head back, and his eyes half covered by supercilious lids. Now, suddenly, he turned himself sideways, and all I could see was dangling hair with a red protruding ear. He scratched among the litter of papers upon his desk. Now, he suddenly turned himself sideways, and all I could see of him was dangling hair with a red protruding ear, as he scratched around amongst the litter of papers on his desk. He faced me presently, with what looked like a very tattered sketchbook in his hand. I am going to talk to you about South America, he said. No comments, if you please. First of all, I wish you to understand that nothing I tell you is to be repeated in any public way unless I give you my express permission. That permission will, in all human probability, never be given. Is that clear? It's, it's very hard. Surely a judicious... He replaced the notebook on the table. That ends it, he said. I wish you a very good morning. No, no, I cried. I submit to any conditions. So far as I can see, I don't have any choice. None in the world, said he. Well, then I promise. Word of honour? Yes, yes, word of honour. He looked at me with doubt in his insolent eyes. Hmm. After all, what do I know about your honour, he said. Upon my word, sir, I said angrily, you take very great liberties. I've never been so insulted in my life. 
He seemed more interested than annoyed at my outbreak. Mm, Round-headed, he muttered. Brachiocephalic, grey-eyed, black-haired with a suggestion of Irish. Mm, Celtic, I presume? Yes, I'm an Irishman, sir. Irish? Irish? Yes, sir. Hmm. That, of course, explains it. Let me see. You have given me your promise that my confidence will be respected? That confidence, I may say, will be far from complete. But I am prepared to give you a few indications which will be of interest. In the first place, you are probably aware that two years ago I made a journey to South America. One which will be classical in the scientific history of the world? Possibly. The object of my journey was to verify some conclusions of Wallace and of Bates, which could only be done by observing their reported facts under the same conditions in which they themselves had noted them. If my expedition had no other results, it still would have been noteworthy. But a curious incident occurred to me whilst I was there, which would open up an entirely fresh line of inquiry. You are aware, or probably in this half-educated age you are not aware, that the country around some parts of the Amazon is still only partially explored, and a great number of tributaries, some of them entirely uncharted, run into the main river. It was my business to visit this little-known back country and examine its fauna, which furnished me with the materials for several chapters of that great and monumental work upon zoology, which will be my life's justification. I was returning, my work accomplished, when I had the occasion to spend a night at a small Indian village, at a point where, in a certain tributary, the name and position of which I withhold, opens into the main river. The natives were the Kakuma Indians, an, an amiable but stunted race with mental powers hardly superior to the average Londoner. I had effected some cures amongst them on my way up the river, and had impressed them considerably with my personality, so that I was not surprised to find myself eagerly awaited upon my return. I gathered from their signs that someone had urgent need of my medical services, and I followed the chief into one of his huts. When I entered, I found that the sufferer to whose aid I had been summoned had, at that instant, expired. But he was, to my surprise, no Indian, but a white man. Indeed, I may say a very white man, for he was flaxen-haired and had some characteristics of an albino. He was clad in rags and very emaciated, and bore every trait of prolonged hardship. So far as I could understand the account of the natives, he was a complete stranger to them, and had come upon their village through the woods alone, in the last stage of exhaustion. The man's knapsack lay beside the couch, and I examined duly the contents. His name was written upon a tab within it. Maple White, Lake Avenue, Detroit, Michigan. It was a name to which I am prepared to always lift my hat. It is not too much to say that it will rank level with my own when the final credit of this business becomes apportioned. From the contents of the knapsack, it was evident that this man had been an artist and a poet in search of effects. There were scraps of verse, and I do not profess to be a judge of such things, but they appeared to be singularly wanting in merit. There were also some rather commonplace pictures of river scenery, a, a paint box, a box of coloured chalks, some brushes, a, a curved bone which lies upon my inkstand, a volume of Baxter's moths and butterflies, a cheap revolver and a few cartridges. Of personal equipment, he had either none or had lost it on his journey. Such were the total effects of this strange American bohemian. I was turning away from him when I observed that something projected from the front of his rugged jacket. It was this sketchbook, which was dilapidated then as you see it now. Indeed, I assure you that a first folio of Shakespeare could not be treated with any greater reverence than this relic has been 
since it came to my possession. I hand it to you now, and ask that you take it page by page and examine the contents. He helped himself to a cigar and leaned back with a fiercely critical eye, taking note to which the effect this document would produce. I had opened the volume with some expectation of revelation, though what nature it was I could not imagine. The first page was disappointing, however, as it contained nothing but the picture of a very fat man in a pea-jacket, with the legend Jimmy Clover on the mailboat, written beneath it. There followed several pages which were filled with small sketches of Indians and their ways. Then came a picture of a cheerful and corpusculent ecclesiastic with a shovel hat, sitting opposite a very thin European with the inscription, Lunch with Friar Costafero at Rosario. Studies of women and babies accounted for several more pages, and there was an unbroken series of animal drawings with explanations such as manatee on sandbank, turtles and their eggs, black ajouti and a miriam palm, the matter disclosing some sort of pig-like animal, and finally came to double-page studies of long-snouted and unpleasant saurians. I could make nothing of it, and said so to the professor. Surely these are only crocodiles. Alligators! Alligators! There is hardly a thing as a true crocodile in South America. The distinction between them... I meant I could see nothing unusual, nothing that would justify what you've said. He smiled serenely. Try the next page. I was still unable to sympathise. It was a full-page sketch of a landscape roughly tinted in colour, the kind of painting which open-air artists take as a guide for a further, more elaborate effort in the future. It was a pale green foreground of feathery vegetation which sloped upwards and ended in a line of cliffs, dark red in colour and curiously ribbed like some basaltic formations that I have seen. They extended in an unbroken wall right across the background. At one point there was an isolated pyramidal rock, crowned by a great tree, which appeared to be separated by a cleft from the main crag. Behind it, a blue tropical sky. A thin green line of vegetation fringed the summit of the ruddy cliff. Well, he asked. It's no doubt a curious formation, said I, but I'm not a geologist, and I you know, don't have enough to say it is wonderful. Wonderful, he repeated. It is unique. It is incredible. No one on earth has ever dreamed of such a possibility. Now, to the next. I turned it over and gave her an exclamation of surprise. It was a full-page picture of the most extraordinary creature that I had ever seen. It was the wild dream of an opium smoker, a vision of delirium. The head was like that of a fowl, the body of a bloated lizard, and the trailing tail was furnished with upturned spikes, and the curved back was edged with a high serrated fringe, which looked like a dozen cock's wattles placed behind each other. In front of this creature was an absurd mannequin, or dwarf in human form, who stood staring at it. Well, what do you think of that? cried the professor, rubbing his hands with an air of triumph. It's, it's monstrous. It's, it's grotesque. But what made him draw such an animal? Well, well, trade gin, I'd think. Oh, is that the best explanation you can give, is it? Well, sir, what's yours? The obvious one is that the creature exists, and it's actually sketched from life. I should have laughed, only that I'd had a vision of us doing another cartwheel down the passage. Uh, no doubt, said I. No doubt, as one humours an imbecile. I, I confess, however, um, that this tiny human figure does puzzle me. If it were an Indian, um, we could set it down as evidence of some pygmy race in America. But he appears to be European, wearing a sun hat. The professor snorted like an angry buffalo. You really do test the limit he said. You enlarge my view of the possible. Cerebral paresis. Mental inertia. <sighs> he was too absurd to make me angry. Indeed, it was a waste of energy. For if you were going to be angry with this man, you would be angry all the time. 
I contented myself with smiling wearily. It struck me that the man was small, said I. Look here, he cried, leaning forward and dabbing a great hairy sausage of a finger behind the animal. I suppose you thought that was a dandelion or a Brussels sprout, did you? What? Well, that vegetable is an ivory palm, and they run to fifty or sixty feet. Don't you see? That man was put there for a purpose. He could really have stood in front of that brute and lived to draw it. He sketched himself to give a scale of heights. He was, shall we say, over five feet. The tree is ten times bigger, which is what one would expect. My word, I cried. Th then you think the beast was... But why, Charing Cross Station could barely make a kennel for such a brute. Apart from exaggeration, he is certainly a well-grown specimen, said the professor complacently. But, I cried, surely that the whole experience of the human race is not set aside on account of a single sketch. I turned over the leaves and ascertained that there was nothing more in the book. A single sketch by a, a wandering American artist, who may have done this under hashish or in a delirium of fever, or simply in order to grat gratify a freakish imagination, can't, as a man of science, defend such a position as that? For the answer, the professor took down a book from the shelf. This is an excellent monograph by my gifted friend, Ray Lancaster, he said. There is an illustration here which would interest you. Ah, here it is. The inscription beneath it runs, Probable appearance in life of the Jurassic dinosaur Stegosaurus. The hind leg alone is twice as tall as a full-grown man. What do you make of that? He handed me the open book. I stared as I looked at the picture. In this reconstructed animal of the dead world, there was certainly a very great resemblance to the sketch of the unknown artist. Well, it certainly is remarkable, said I. But you won't admit it is final? Surely it might be a coincidence, or maybe this American had seen a picture of this kind and carried it to his memory. It would be very likely to recur to a man in a delirium. Very good, said the professor indulgently. We'll leave it at that. And now I'll ask you to look at this bone. He handed over one which he'd already described as part of the dead man's possessions. It was about six inches long and thicker than my thumb with some indications of dried cartilage at one end. To what known creature does that bone belong? asked the professor. I examined it with care and tried to recall some half-forgotten knowledge. Um, it, it, it might be a thick collarbone, I said. My companion waved his hand in contemptuous depreciation. The human collarbone is curved. This is straight. There is a groove upon its surface, showing that a great tendon played across it, which would not have been the case with a clavicle. I must confess, then, I don't know what it is. You need not be ashamed to expose your ignorance, for I don't suppose the whole of South Kensington staff could give a name to it. He took a little bone the size of a bean out of a pillbox. So far as I am a judge, of this human bone is an analogue to the one which you hold in your hand. That will give you some idea of the size of the creature. You will observe from the cartilage that this is no fossil specimen, but recent. What do you say to that? Surely it is an elephant. He winced as if in pain. Don't! Don't talk of elephants in South America, even in these days of board schools. Well. I interrupted. Any large South American animal, a, a tapir, for example. You may take it, young man, that I am versed in the elements of my business. This is not a conceivable bone, either of a tapir or any other creature known to zoology. It belongs to a very large, a very strong, and, by all analogy, a very fierce animal which exists upon the face of the earth, but has not yet come under the notice of science. You are still unconvinced? I am at least deeply interested. Then your case is not hopeless. I feel that there is reason lurking in you somewhere, so we will patiently grope around for it. We will now leave the dead American and 
proceed with my narrative. You can imagine that I could hardly come away from the Amazon without probing deeper into the matter. There were indications as to the direction for which the dead traveller had come. Indian legends alone could have been my guide, for I found some rumours of a strange land were common amongst all the ravine tribes. You have no doubt heard of the Kapuri? Uh, never. The Kapuri is a spirit of the woods, something terrible, something malevolent, something to be avoided. No one can describe its shape or nature, but it is a word of terror along the Amazon. Now, all tribes agree as to the direction in which the Kapuri lives, but it was the same direction from which the American had come. Something terrible lay that way, and it was my business to find out what. So, so what did you do? My flippancy was all gone. This massive man compelled one's attention and respect. I overcame the extreme reluctance of the natives, a reluctance which extends even to talk upon the subject, and by judicious persuasion and gifts, aided, I will admit, by some threats of coercion, I got two of them to act as guides. After many adventures, which I need not describe, and after travelling a distance I will not mention, in a direction which I withhold, we came at last to a tract of country which has never been described, nor indeed visited, save by my unfortunate predecessor. Would you kindly look at this? He handed me a photograph, half plate in size. The unsatisfactory appearance of it is due to the fact, he said, that on descending the river the boat was upset and the case which contained the undeveloped films was broken with disastrous results. Nearly all of them were ruined, an irreparable loss. This is one of the few which partially escaped. This explains the deficiencies or abnormalities and you will kindly accept it. There is no talk of faking. I am not in the mood to argue such a point. The photograph was certainly off-coloured. An unkind critic might easily have misinterpreted that dim surface. It was a dull grey landscape, and as I deciphered the details along it, I realised it represented a long, enormously high line of cliffs, exactly like an immense cataract seen in the distance with a sloping, tree-clad plain in the foreground. I, I believe it's the same place as in the painted picture, said I. It is the same place, the professor answered. I found traces of the fellow's camp. Now, look at this. It was a nearer view of the same scene. Although the photograph was extremely defective, I could distinctly see the isolated, tree-crowned pinnacle of rock which detached from the crowd. I have no doubt at all. Well, that is something gained, he said. We progress, do we not? Now, would you please look at the top of that rocky pinnacle? Do you observe something there? Uh, an enormous tree. But on the tree? A large bird, said I. He handed me a lens. Yes, I said, peering through it. A, a large bird in the tree. It appears to have a considerable beak. I'd, I'd say it was a pelican. I cannot congratulate you or your eyesight. It is not a pelican, nor is it indeed a bird. It may interest you to know that I succeeded in shooting that particular specimen. It's the only absolute proof of my experiences, and it was a thing I was able to bring away with me. You have it, then? Here, at last, was tangible corroboration. I had it. It was unfortunately lost with so much else in the same boat accident which ruined my photographs. I clutched at it as it disappeared in the swirl of the rapids, and part of its wing was left in my hand. I was insensible when washed ashore, but the miserable remnant of my superb specimen was still intact. I now lay it before you. From a drawer he produced what seemed to be a large upper portion of the wing of a bat, it was at least two feet in length, though, a curved bone with a membranous veil beneath it. A monstrous bat, I suggested. <laughs> Nothing of the sort, said the professor severely. Living as I do in an educated and scientific atmosphere, I could not have conceived that the first principles of zoology were so little known. 
Is it possible that you do not know the elementary fact of comparative anatomy, that the wing of a bird is really the forearm, while the wing of a bat consists of three elongated fingers with membranes between? Now, in this case, the bone is certainly not the forearm, and you can see yourself that this is a single membrane hanging upon a single bone. Therefore, it cannot belong to a bat. But if it is neither bird nor bat, what is it? My small stock of knowledge was exhausted. I, I really don't know, said I. He opened the standard work to which he had already referred me. Here, he said, pointing to the picture of an extraordinary flying monster, is an excellent reproduction of the dimorphodon, or pterodactyl, a flying reptile of the Jurassic period. On the next page is a diagram of the mechanism of its wing. Kindly compare it with the specimen in your hand. A wave of amazement passed over me as I looked. I was convinced. There could be no getting away from it. The cumulative proof was overwhelming. The sketch, the photographs, the narrative, and now the actual specimen. The evidence was complete, and I said so. I said so warmly, for I felt the professor was an ill-used man. He leaned back in his chair with his drooping eyelids and a tolerant smile, basking in this sudden gleam of sunshine. It, it's just the very biggest thing I've ever heard of, said I though it's my journalistic rather than my scientific enthusiasm that was roused. It's colossal. You are a Columbus of science. You've discovered a lost world. I really am awfully sorry if I seem to doubt you. It was all so unthinkable. But I understand evidence when I see it, and this should be good enough for anybody. The professor purred with satisfaction. Then, sir, what did you do next? It was the wet season, Mr Malone, and my stores were exhausted. I explored some portion of this huge cliff, but I was unable to find a way to scale it. The pyramidal rock on which I saw and shot the pterodactyl was more accessible. Being something of a cragsman, I did manage to get to the top of that. From the summit, I had a better idea of the plateau upon top of the crags. It appeared to be very large, neither to the east nor the west could I see any end of the vista of green-capped hills. Below it is a swampy jungle region full of snakes, insects and fever. It is a natural protection to this singular country. Did you see any other signs of life? No, sir, I did not. But during the week that William camped at the base of the cliffs, we heard some very strange noises from above. But the creature that the American drew... How do you account for that? We can only suppose that he must have made his way to the summit and seen it up there. We know, therefore, there is a way up. We know equally it must be a very difficult one, otherwise the creatures would have come down and overrun the surrounding country. Surely that's clear. But how do they come to be up there? I do not think the problem is a very obscure one, said the professor. There can only be one explanation. South America, as you may have heard, is a granite continent. At this single point in the interior there has been, in some far distant age, a great, sudden, volcanic upheaval. These cliffs, I may remark, are basilic, and therefore plutonic. An area, perhaps as large as Sussex, has been lifted up on block, with all its living contents, and cut off by perpendicular precipices of hardness which defies erosion from all the rest of the continent. What is the result? Why, the ordinary laws of nature are suspended. The various checks which influence the struggle for existence in the world at large are all neutralised, or at least altered. Creatures survive which would otherwise disappear. You observe both the pterodactyl and the stegosaurus are Jurassic and therefore of great age in the order of life. They have been artificially conserved by these strange, accidental conditions. But surely your evidence is conclusive. You only have to lay it before the authorities. So, in my simplicity, I had imagined, said the professor bitterly. I can only tell you it was not so, and that I was met at every turn by incredulity, born partly from stupidity, 
and partly from jealousy. It is not my nature, sir, to cringe to any man, nor to seek to prove a fact if my word has been doubted. After the first, I have not been condescended to show such corroborative proofs as I possess. The subject became hateful to me, and I would not speak of it. When men, like yourself, who represent the foolish curiosity of the public, came to disturb my privacy, I was unable to meet them with a dignified reserve. By nature, I am, I will admit, a somewhat fiery person, and under provocation am inclined to be violent. I fear you may have remarked it. I nursed my eye and was silent. My wife has frequently remonstrated with me upon the subject, and yet I fancy that any man of honour would still feel the same. Tonight, however, I propose to give an extreme example of control of will over emotions. I invite you to be present at the exhibition. He handed me a card from his desk. You will perceive that Mr Percival Waldron, a naturalist of some popular repute, is announced to lecture at 8.30 at the Zoological Institute's Hall of the Recorded Ages. I have specially been invited to present upon the evening platform and move a vote of thanks for the lecturer. While doing so, I shall make it my business, with infinite tact and delicacy, to throw out a few remarks which may arouse the interest of the audience and cause some of them to desire to go more deeply into the matter. Nothing contentious, you understand, but only an indication that there are greater depths beyond. I shall hold myself strongly in leash and see whether, by this self-restraint, I can attain a more favourable result. And I may come? I asked gingerly. Why, surely, he answered cordially. He had an enormously genial manner, which was almost as overpowering as his violence. His smile of benevolence was a wonderful thing, when his cheeks would suddenly bunch into two red apples between his half-closed eyes and his great black beard. By all means, come. It will be a comfort to me to know that I have at least one ally in the hall, however insufficient and ignorant of the subject he may be. I fancy there will be a large audience, for Waldron, though an absolute charlatan, has a considerable popular following. Now, Mr Malone, I have given you rather more of my time than I had intended. The individual must not monopolise that which is meant for the world. I shall be pleased to see you at the lecture tonight. In the meantime, you will understand that no public use is to be made of any of the material that I have given to you. But, but Mr. McArdle, my, my news editor, you know, he will want to know what I've done. Tell him what you like. You can say, among other things, that if he sends anyone else to intrude upon me, I shall call upon him with a riding whip. But I leave it to you that nothing of this will appear in print. Very good. Then, to the Zoological Institute's Hall at 8.30 tonight. I had a last impression of red cheeks, a blue rippling beard and intolerant eyes as he waved me out of the room. End of chapter four. Well, that's completed the first magazine of the Stratton, and we're now going to move on uh, next time to the second volume and uh, see what happens in the Great Hall. Hope you've been enjoying these um, stories so far. Um, and I'd be very grateful if you could uh, like the video and also potentially subscribe to the channel and you'll get an update when the next chapter is available. On that, I'll say goodnight. Take care.